and David started to take off I think there was a bit of rivalry there and uh, David would always watch Matt Rowland's career and study it he would always be going on about it you know well Matt's just been to America and he's not cracked America yet and we're going out next week <laughs> it was like that playing football team you know he would always watch what he was doing and how he was getting on and then I think he wanted to, to, to get bigger than Matt you know because we hadn't quite got to the same level at that time as, as Matt, Matt Boland was at with T-Rex and I think David wanted to you know get to the top of the division before he did album wise um after the slider, I don't think there was ever a great album. Tanks was recorded very quickly. I think we possibly moved on 15 to 17 tracks in three days. Mark had a lot of ideas going through his head at the time, but I really love Tanks. I think, in hindsight, even more so now than then. I think because of all the, the rush and the hubbub that was going on at the time, you think, oh, it's, everything's in a rush to get something out. But looking back, it's a lovely album. There's some beautiful songs on it. By the time we made the uh, album Tanks, all, a lot of the keyboard playing, the Mellotron and even recorders and all that, that was me playing it. I was the, the other the member of the band who could play all the stranger instruments. And uh, when you get the album and you, you read the credits, I, I challenged Mark. I said, why aren't my credits there? It's just produced by Tony Visconti. He goes, he says, well, I worked it out that your name would appear more times than mine. So I'm not going to, I didn't feel like you should get more credit than me. Tony used to go in the studio after Mark and re, re, and re -tune Mark's guitars because they're always over tune. And Tony would go in and afterwards and, and tune them to make sure they were right. And he would go in and clean up ta tapes afterwards, which after Mark had gone, you know, he would, he very much, he really cared. Everyone in the group had this kind of same passive personality. They were very subservient to Mark. I was the only person in the setup who could actually not really give him give it back to him, but I could tell him the truth. We would have debates. I knew he was the kind of artist that you couldn't uh, twist his arm to make him do anything. He he was terrified of losing face in front of people. If I had something to say to him, I realized I would have to take him out in the corridor and tell him very privately, even if it was his guitar being out of tune. If I told him his guitar was out of tune in front of other people, he would, you know, lash out at me and say, no it isn't, you're crazy, you're deaf, or something like that. I can remember, sort of, we just coming back from a tour of the States, looking forward to like a fortnight at home and the very next day uh, I got a phone call saying that because um, Mark had stayed in LA to do a TV thing and uh, he wanted us back there so I go back to the airport the next day do a 12 hour flight back just to go and mime for three minutes. In a period where he had less time to be creative he was he was really repeating himself I had to come to that conclusion myself it didn't go unaddressed I would speak to him a lot about this. I said, you know, like truck on tyke, uh, we didn't really go very far in a new direction. Like, uh, I think we used an oboe on the record. He would say, he would think by using another orchestral instrument, that would be enough to change the character of the record. But there's this little oboe tucked in the background. That was just like the only difference between that and the two or three previous singles. I got him for PR actually at the point in his career when he was actually on a bit of a, a, a bit of a downward path. Um, although tanks didn't do too badly. I mean, it, it, it certainly caused a bit of um, controversy with the sleeve anyway, which people were claiming was obs obscene because he was sitting astride the barrel of a tank. The tanks album, I think it, what it did was it sold uh, um, in the UK and Europe, it did pretty well. And I think it sold because of, of where he was at that particular point. But um, it, it, again, it failed more so in the States, you know, um, you know, not even getting really inside the top 100 really and, and um, you know, I mean that's, again I'm sure that had a massive effect on him. Tanks had this rather dubious picture of Mark Estrada tank with the barrel pointed outwards. Mary White's house 
um, who was a, a campaigner of, of keeping um, TV clean, she was outraged because she said it, it was um, phallic and, and uh, she tried to get the album cover banned uh, as being obscene. Uh, and I think that, uh, that was good publicity for Mark. Born to Boogie's on there, uh, which is an interesting point because Born to Boogie was the name of the film that he did with Ringo Starr and stuff, and that song isn't on the film, in the film. So that was interesting for a start. It had a, a fuller sound and um, although it wasn't sort of quite as, as commercially successful um, and Mark, so you could see Mark had perhaps put on a little bit of weight, um, you know, it, it still had some sort of really good songs on it. I just think with Tanks, it, it's just, it showed that he was a little bit, not, how can anyone be bored, but boredish. And he's sort of into autopilot. He's T Rex is is now a machine. It's going on, and I don't think he's he's been out of he has because the American thing has not sort of happened as well as it could have done. I think he's sort of struggling a bit with where does he go next. He he, he didn't have the in the height in America. Um, I just don't think they knew what to do with him. I think they didn't know what to do with glam rock. You know, by the time they were dealing with glam rock, Kiss had, and Bowie broke at the same time, so it was okay for Bowie because Kiss had come through. So they're like, "All oh, right, make up glam rock. Oh yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we can deal with that." But you know, it was too late for him. The Groover, I think, is another feature track that uh, uh, that had um, basically that gave Mickey Finn uh, certainly something to do. It was uh, Mickey and his conga plane. starting to reflect a, a, a slight decline in Mark's popularity uh, because it went to number four you know and if I got a single at number four I'd be quite I'd be quite happy that's quite successful slippery slope for me <laughs> it's like sounds a bit like we need another single there's a point where you think that you're impregnable where you think it doesn't matter what I write I'm writing great stuff and all of a sudden the audience turned around and yeah, that wasn't that, that wasn't that good. You, you go, ah, what do you mean? Everything I write's great. You love everything I write. At the time, everything that Mark brought out I thought was wonderful. Um, but I, I definitely remember that, that sort of, you know, by the time the Groover um, came out, my f the, the amount of my friends who were, were still T-Rex fans was starting to, to diminish. <laughs> I love the fact that it started, you know, T-R-E-X, although of course obviously that was one of the things that, 